Fellow auto detailers, welcome to the show that features interviews with today's most successful auto detailers. This is the Auto Detailing Podcast. Here's your host, Jimbo Balaam. Hey, what's up, everyone? Before we get into this week's episode, considering we have an Aussie guest on the show, I thought it'd be very fitting to talk about autofiber.com. Dot au. That's where you can get all the auto fiber goodies that I've been talking about in the U.S., but in Australia. So check out autofiber.com.au if you're in Australia, and let's get right into today's show. Enjoy. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome to this episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. I'm Jimbo, your host. Today we have, actually, for a fun fact, the very first person I ever had on the show as an interview guest uh, from one of my favorite places in the world that I've never been to yet, or haven't been to yet, rather, and that is Matt Gibb, so from uh, Australia. What part of Australia again, Matt? I'm in Adelaide, South Adelaide. Australia. Adelaide, there you go. The bottom. Well, not quite the bottom, close to the bottom, yeah. Tasmania is b- 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 lower than us. There you go. But, uh, yeah. Thanks for Girl coming back on the show. Adelaide. Yeah, thanks for having me again. It's been a while, but it's, it's good to be back. <laughs> it's been a long while, so I think it's been... A couple years, actually, which is kind of crazy to think about. So uh, for those people yep. that have never heard you on the show before, I really encourage you to go back and search Matt, and maybe I'll play some throwback episodes to – we've done, a, gosh, a handful of episodes on all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but, yeah, we have. <laughs> but catch us up to speed. What's been going on in your world the past couple years? Okay, so um, I ran my business – um, up until, what was it, that last year, I was, did last two years done really well. And then um, in July last year, I decided that it was time for me to basically try and move on and get into the training field because there's a lot I, need, I would like to pass on to the next generation and the guys who are still in it or even perhaps older than me that could pick up a few things. And um, the way the market is with the amount of saturation of detailers that are here, not even though there are a lot more really great guys here, um, I thought, look, it's time for me to move on. And I applied at a number of places, had no luck, and then I thought, hang on a minute, I know of a company that advertises quite heavily and they're a mobile franchise detailing company. I'll contact them and see if they need me. And send them my resume that I'd just done myself um, and links to um, a job seeker site with some, some of my best work on there and some photos of other work. And five minutes later, the phone rang and mm. uh, yeah, went down to see, went to, down to see uh, Joel, the owner. And um, next thing you know, I'm the head trainer and head detailer there. So wow. I've started doing a little bit of training of the uh, – He's, he's uh, one and only employee, and eventually he'll be doing training all of his franchisees, um, mm. hopefully, you know, in Melbourne soon and other states. And my goal basically is to turn this company into the new leader of, you know, mobile franchise detailing mm-hmm. in the country. So, so um, I have a quick question just because I'm curious. Mm. What was the th- what was the reasoning behind going and working for someone? Was it to kind of create stability and still stay within detailing so that you could focus on building up this training side of things or what was yeah, the Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, pretty much stability. I mean, the business has look, I I've done I've done okay over the years, but never built it to the level that some people do. Um, basically the whole reason I my business lasted 12 years was simply my reputation, Mm. the reputation I built up for the world-class work I was doing with people were just, you know, everyone kept saying, I need some Matt's magic, you know. Um, Matt's magic, I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, So it was, I went into it, you know, I made a lot of mistakes of going, look, this job's really giving me the shits. Mm. I'm having to do things that, I shouldn't have to do mm. for this dealership. I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to do this, this, this. And all I need is this much per week, blah, blah, blah. Got into it with no real marketing skills, business mm. skills, even though my dad just got piles and helped me out a lot and got me to where I am uh, for the last five, six years at least. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know. And look, I got better and better, made more and more money, but it just never got to the point where it was making, you know, two hundred thousand a year, mm-hmm. four hundred thousand million, um, anything like that. So, but um, you know, I just thought, look, I need some stability. I just don't. I just got to the point. Where I just didn't want to run a business anymore. Yep. I said I want to train, but I just don't want to do all this anymore. I don't want to be the, you know be this one man band or me and one guy doing everything i'm just tired of it um yep. <laughs> you know, and i just wanted to train. my passion just went to training i wanted mm. i want to pass on the knowledge that i have got thanks to mainly my mentor and teacher uh in sydney and and pass it on and help people mm-hmm. the people who help me yeah you know it's it's I wanted to I wanted you to go down that route and kind of explain that because I think it's a fairly common thing where it, it's kind of uh, underestimated how much work it is to detail and run a business, right? And it's exhausting, it's, it's, you know. It's so hard. It's so it hard. Can be hard. You can it, it really can, you know, and to always you know be adapting to all the different changing, you know, marketing and advertising methods. I mean, yeah. my dad started his business, which he grew to a really large size, um, you know, because he's a very driven man. I am somewhat driven too. Um, it was basically, you know, do you really be really good at re- building relationships with people, networking, business networking, have a, have a big friggin' ad in yellow pages yeah. and stick a sign at the front and you're done. And yep. it's like, well, you know, 15 years later, it's like, oh, well, you really can't do that anymore. Yep. You got to need this and this and this, and then it just go, it's just going to keep on changing. One day, somebody's going to may take over from Google, and then you're going to go, now what do I have to do? For sure, going to happen. For sure, and that's why it's never going to stop. Right? Yep. Some people ask me like, oh, why do you like? I'm putting a big emphasis on my YouTube right now, and it's like, well, it, you know, and people are saying, well, why are you still doing the podcast? And if you're doing if you're doing YouTube and it's like, because you have to be diversified too. It's great. You know, it's like, but you're right. It's yes, like, you I, I was just having a conversation with uh, a gentleman here in the States and he texts me and he's like, I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. And I'm like, I know, man, you're trying to create videos. You're trying to run a business. You got a, a full-time oh. job. You got a family. It's like, it's brutal, you know? So it's, it is brutal. you know, it's and sometimes where it's brutal. And, and then, yeah. And that, yeah, and we're not even talking about detailing, right? We're just talking about running the business. <laughs> we haven't even talked yeah. about like actually having oh. to do the work, you know. So that is, I'm glad we went down that route, and I'm glad you were vulnerable enough to share that because it's it's commendable yeah. to kind of tuck your tail between your legs and and just go work for someone else because you want to focus on something something else like training. So I think it's actually commendable. Yeah. So how yep. how long Definitely. have you been at? How long have you been working? for someone then and um, basically about three months so far okay. um and the hours the hours are going to get better um you know and there's a lot to do um just yesterday i was working on developing well as a service he he's got that uh, he wants me to basically improve it you know the efficiency of it and i've done a t- complete de- technical data sheet because i am mr technical not as good as kevin brown he's like mega scientific blows my mind um, but basically a technical data sheet of, okay, this is the service, these are the pads you're going to use, this is the products you're going to use, the machines you're going to use, the time frame, the price per hour, um, the absolute process step by step by step by step and, you know, so the guys can just get on it and go, you know, do it. And there's always going to be some adaption necessary, you know, with every every car you're going to get something and go, oh, that's not working, so mm-hmm. it's like, okay, change pad, do this, do that. <clears throat> but... um. Yeah, doing that yesterday and then working on the op- updating the operations manual. So cause right. that's way outdated. So you've you've but pretty much t- you're taking more of an admin role in establishing establishing processes and and kind of you found yeah. your sweet spot within a company to make mm. to kind of team up together to to play to both your strengths to make the company better, right? Yeah, that's what it I mean, like. I, yeah. I never liked franchise detailing much. I mean, I've never seen. Mm. I've, I mean, there are there are good guys out there that can do it. I've just not seen any. Mm-hmm. But I thought, you know what? If if I can, you know, if I can actually get these guys to where look, they're doing well now, mm-hmm. sales wise. But if they can, you know, become fucking make them into the new leader by being so efficient, right? Um, and you know, being innovative, thinking outside the box. I'm an outside the box thinker. I mean, I I I wish everybody 
you know, got rid of like, people who were doing it, you know, think, thought outside the box and said, right, look, you know, mm-hmm. this is not the 20th century anymore. You know, wash, wax, cut, polish, fur protection, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we still do that sort of thing. Mm. But, you know, have some services that are a bit more that are new, that are innovative, that are different. You know, mm. the, not so different that people can't understand it because then you can't sell it. But, you know, a little bit different. So um, give us an example of that. Different. Give us, Give us an example of that. <laughs> Well, you know, wash and wax is a fine service and everyone needs their car washed and waxed. But I just feel that, look, wax has its place sometimes. But I think, you know, most people, if they're doing a wash and wax, they're doing it with a, a shampoo that's got a synthetic wax in it. And it's not going to last as long as a dedicated, maybe not last as long as a dedicated wax you put on afterwards. What if you go to wash and seal? I mean, I've been doing washes and and clays and permanent on golding Right. Gold permanent on gold shining the car because it's a natural silica mm-hmm. uh, based product. It's water based, doesn't streak like some of the other ones do. Mm. And you're basically putting a really strong color enhancing protection layer on there, which no polymer I've seen will ever match. And it's a little bit new. It's different. It's it's not like groundbreaking, but it's easier and it's just good. I mean, and then you could probably take it way further than that now. I mean, who knows right. what you could do. But just a little bit, you know, change it up, do something. I mean, I wish we could do washing coatings, but we can't. Right, right. Not, Maybe. Not we're, really getting, we're getting there. Right, close. We're getting there. Maybe one day we'll get there. Right. Um, but just try and, you know, I mean, I hate the status quo. Mm. I hate it with a passion. I, things always have to move. I'm, I'm all about, I love positive change. Mm-hmm. If change is positive, I'm all over it, like a, you know, all over it. But if it's negative, not so much. But I, I just don't stand still. I mean, I remember my idol Bruce Lee once said, you know, flowing water never grows stale. You just got to keep mm. on flowing. So you just got to keep moving, moving forward, getting better, doing, coming up with new services, doing something, find something innovative, create something innovative, um, and always make it fresh, keep it fresh, mm-hmm. always changing. Um, you know, not so fast people go, well, oh, gee, I can't keep up, but. I mean, always move. Don't sit there and go, well, this is the way I've used, this is the polish I've used for 30 years yep. and this machine and this speed. You just can't do that. I agree. You've got to keep moving. Yep. It, it's such a trap, too, that people, and I, <laughs> it used to frustrate me so bad because when I first started in detailing, that was that was what the older guys always said, right? Like, well, I've been doing this for 30 years and I know how to do it. And it's like, why, why the ego like that? You know, I feel like even being Uh, in it, even being in it, you know, I've only been running my business for over 10, just over 10 years, but it's like, I found that I actually learn the most when I bring on new guys to come help me. It's like, yep. Everybody brings something to the table. Everyone brings something to the table, you know? That's so, right. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Keep going. Sorry. So this basically leads into you know future products in yep. the industry and tools. Yep. Probably post twenty twenty, and some of these I'm going to mention probably may look they may not happen. They may depends on willingness of the manufacturers. There is cost in the serious cost involved with making a revolutionary polish. Mm-hmm. Um, and abrasive technology, but I think it's something that one day we're going to need, if not sooner than later. I mean, they're all, we've got some good stuff these days, but it can go so much further. Um, you know, so yeah, so basically, one thing that I've had a vision for since 2007, and this is something I really truly really believe that will happen one day. It, look, it may, not, it may take five years, it may take two, it might take 25. I don't know. But I believe that one day it will happen, and that is the universal polishing pad. So basically, yep. the universal polishing pad is, mm. from the outset, it's going to be a, a pad that can be used with the ideal thickness and density for basically every machine type, but it also is able to do virtually everything that you would normally need, wool, microfiber, shore buff, rayon, whatever else, and two or three foams, or one or two foams at least, to do, to do a whole paint correction process. It'll just be one pad mm. for maybe anywhere between 75% of cases, maybe even 100 one day. You'll just literally just be able to just go, put the pad on there, modify this, modify that, um, you know, machine speeds, backing plate thicknesses and machine types and arm speeds and all this other stuff and it will just do different stuff. 
And look, we don't. We probably know we're near that yet, but I mean, I really believe it's going to happen. Um, I, I think we're getting close, and I I share that same kind of vision uh, that you do as well. And I think we're starting to see kind of like glimpses of it when we have even yep. liquids come out, you know, in the the liquid yeah. technology, whether it's 3D coming out with their one compound polish, whatever, which is very similar to HD Speed. But then we have even mm. the the Meguiar's new 110 being a little less aggressive and being able to finish out a little bit easier. So yeah, I, I think right. I are think finishing out a lot better. You know, the yeah, the aggressive compounds are. So I think and there are to what to your point of what you were talking about with pads, I think they're we're like getting there, but you're right. We're not I think we're closer with the liquid technology than we are with the pad mm. technology. Yeah. You agree? I, I mean it could be it go I, I definitely agree. And I think Though that the um, it may have to come from it may have to be like some kind of variable foam technology. Mm. Um, I mean, we Shoal have got some of theirs. They call you know like Blue Universal mm-hmm. and other things like that. My manufacturer, who's a global manufacturer in in France, have a blue pad that I absolutely love, which I think. Um, was actually used by another company to make one of their pads, but they've just had it tweaked a fraction more aggressive. Um, but I bought a stack of those, and they cost me like two or three euros a piece, and they're world-class European foam, and they're designed to work all day long in paint plants, car mm. plants and things like that. And that's basically got two different thicknesses, but they both can be used basically on any machine. They're dense enough to work on random, long, long sorry, random orbital, rotary, gear-driven, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, but I think... Seeing what Rup has, has done with the melee line pads, where it's just three grades, that is the start of where I believe it's going to go. Now, I think it'll get to the point where ne- the next thing will be basically you'll get two grades of foam that will possibly replace the need of five or six traditional traditional foams. It, they'll basically be able to do four or five different grades of things you know, so you'll have two pads, and they'll do up to four different levels of, of work. And then we'll go to the universal pad. Um, because then look at root pads. They don't have seven grades of foam. I mean, it's great having seven grades of foam, like the Lake Country line and all that. They're fantastic pads. Um, but I don't think we're going to stay there. I mean, I think that's – they're very – you know, if you go from, say, purple, yellow, green – you know, your orange, your white, your black, blue, red, crimsons, and your golds, and then 110 pour per inch ivories, 120 pour per inch from Dunlop, and things like this. It's a lot of foam, and it's a lot of foam to choose from. But if you can have two or three grades, be able to do what four or five grades used to have. You needed four or five grades to do, and then one. Then the next step is bang, we go straight to to the universal pad, which probably five years, ten years later. I think that's how it's going to go. And Rupes has shown that little bit that maybe we're starting to get there. Definitely, definitely. And I, I hope, I hope we do eventually get there. I don't think the, I think the, the if you think about it from a business standpoint, I think a business standpoint of the manufacturers, I think they're going to do everything in their power to slow that down because look, they sell less pads that no, way, no. right? <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. But that I is think the professionals the going to drive it you know, and, and demand that. And I think, I I know I try to, I I try to implement that now. And of course, what usually ends up happening to me is it ends up being too aggressive, right? So I take like the buff and shine Oreo pad or the red or the black and white pad and pair it with like Mm. a medium, a medium polish. And it's usually too aggressive, right? So there's, there's that balance where I guess that's where the, the, like my favorites on one steps are like an all in one with an aggressive pad, like a, some sort of right. uh, microfiber pad. And that usually works yep. out pretty nice. But I think that to your point, when we get because efficiency, time savings and profitability through that are so important to so many detailers that it's, that yeah. is what's going to drive that. And though other pads may be uh, in the mix still to make up that, you know, oddball five ten percent of paints that are weird or situations yeah, that are weird yeah. or whatever so i don't think yeah. I, and i don't think you're talking about completely eliminating them forever just for the no. bulk of the work um yeah could be done with this universal pad where do machines play yeah. a role in that then 
Well, obviously, uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but pretty much, like I said, you know, if we can, if the pad can be something that can be used on every kind of machine, which microfiber on rotary, you sort of can use it, but it's a bit of a furphy. Mm. Um, it can be done, but it's like, whoa, watch the heat, people, and look at, watch out for the marring you right. might get, may right. get. Um, so it's going to have to be some kind of new revolutionary textile or something because there's a lot of textiles that are always coming out mm. um i think there's going to be a lot of groundbreaking stuff going on in all sorts of industries from 2020 onwards um i've sort of foreseen it for the last 10 years is it's going to be sort of this um boom period where mm. it's just going to take off and look it may not it may just everyone may just hit the brakes right and stall them. i sit there going god damn it hurry up already right <laughs> um but um hopefully it does end up mm-hmm. being that boom time and there's revolutionary textiles and because you know i i mean i love microfiber pads in some for some things sometimes mm-hmm. but you know what there's two big down uh downsides to that for me and that's heat yes you can control that um Rupert's done a good job with their pads to basically have plenty of ventilation and all that but it's a petrol synthetic petroleum fiber or material i don't like synthetic materials i'm a natural fiber person you just cannot beat nature it provides everything you need for life and it provides everything you need for mm. a lot of things that you need for detailing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we haven't even hit the, like, absolutely gone to absolutely every every length of um, detail as far as, like, you know, we haven't used ev- probably every single type of wool out there. I mean, there's, mm. there's uh, ultra-fine wool from Tasmania that most European clothing brands buy and it's probably more expensive. But, God, I'd love to work with some 12 to 14 micron ultra fine grade wool that'd be pretty awesome mm. Interesting. Um, and there is a particular animal out there that's got a wool that is so damn fine it costs stupid amount of money to buy like a tiny a small amount mm. but i mean imagine if we got our hands on that and if that worked out well holy crap it'd be expensive Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be for everybody, but far out. It could be really, really good. You could almost like do one step with wool and just go, look at that done. Thank you very much. Um, maybe. But, yeah, the universal pad is really something that I feel it'll come one day. Um, the manufacturer may not like it because they go, well, I can't sell this pad and this pad and this pad and this pad. But I'm sorry, guys, but the time has to come at some point where something comes along that doesn't – have the heat and the other issues of microfiber doesn't have the problems of tr- some problems of the traditional wool um, and foams downsides. It can just cater for everything. But machines, um, it's hard to say actually. Like I mean, how you could? I still haven't really mastered or worked out how you know changing from a rotary to a gear driven to a long throw, whatever could change what it does and your arm speed. And machine speeds and pressures and how much polish, what polish, compound, whatever. Um, so there's a lot up in the air still about that. But in your way, be interesting. Let's to, come. to touch on the pad thing, if we think about it though, th- there there are two ends of the spectrum, right? And I'm just thinking, uh, sorry to go back, but thinking about from sorry? the manufacturer standpoint, right? Because even now there still are, uh, you know, a lot of take dealerships, right? For example, detailing at dealerships, at least here in the States, a lot of them are still on the three-step system with like a, you know, Mm -hmm. rotary with wool and then, you know, rotary with foam. And then they're just kind of getting into like the finishing out with a DA, you know, but yeah, think about how long that's been out, you know? Yeah. And look, there's nothing, I mean, personally, in some ways, there's nothing really wrong with doing a three-step. And, and there's nothing I wrong mean, with I, it, right? So I, th- I think that will always no. still be too, right? So I think I think we're talking about like, uh, you know, obviously this episode is about like future technology, right? So I think there will always be people like you and I that are kind of on the, cru- the cusp of the newest and latest technology, but it's going to take literally decades. Yeah, I've always wanted to be on the forefront. I, it, I, same here, yeah. right? But there, it's going to take decades for like the old school methods to like phase <laughs> out, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, especially when you've got people who, who might be in the crash shop game, they may not be, who, you know, go, oh, I've polished this way for 20, 30 years and got great results. You're working on exactly. acrylic. You can't yep, hit true. urethane paint like you hit acrylic. You just can't do that. 
you know, oh, I can hit it with 3,000 RPM and reflow it and all that. So you do that to your thing, you'll kill it. Right, right. You'll absolutely kill it. You just can't do that. Um, you know, so you just – it's – there's nothing – I mean, I can't stand closed-minded people. I was once one of them many, many years ago. Then I just went and opened and said, I'm just going to always be open. I'm going to always be open to everybody's ideas and suggestions mm-hmm. and take things on and try them, do it the old Bruce Lee way, you know. Try someone's way. They yep. like it, discard it, develop and develop your own. Come up with your own, whatever is what is uniquely your own. Right. Um, you know, if you can. But um, look, I think the whole, you know, the Rupes three, three pad system is a start of where we should be heading. Um, but the three step system, look, I mean, back in what 11, 12, 13 years ago, when I started my business, I was charging fifteen hundred dollars to two grand to do a car with a three-step, with a rotary, rotary, random orbital, mm. short throw, like six mil, six mil throw, dual orbit throw, random orbital sander, which I just put a washer mod on it and basically made it spin better, so it actually would spin at speed one, because mm-hmm. it wasn't, or two. Um, and I was getting great results, but of course, if you're going to do that, you've got to charge for it, because unless you're right. a lot better than me, which probably, there's plenty of people out there probably running rings around me as far as how fast they can cut you know correct a car and and sort of have it done but i'm all about the finish so i'll sit there and i'll i used to sit there and jewel it and do all this long cycle stuff i'm more short cycle these days but there's nothing wrong with it if people are prepared to pay for it and you do it right hundred you know, percent that is that is gold right there if people are willing to pay for it right i mean you get Great a, point. get a rotary i'm gonna get a rotary out and you want me to use a rotary and do that um you better be paying some dollars yep. because I mean, I'm sure Ivan could probably do the whole car in four hours, and I sit there going, "Holy <laughs> shit!" But I can't. I'm right. a bit more, you know. I mean, fortunately these days, you know, I've always loved trying low speed, even mm-hmm. when I couldn't do it. And I started going, "What if I do DA at this speed? You know, speed one and two, and I get far better results, but it took longer." But now I'm just like, now I just like sit there, speed one on a rotary, one and a half, mm. and and we're back to one, and then DA is at like two, three. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I wish we could do it all at one on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, you go, Shit, are, that's are, good. Are you loving the variable speed triggers then? Because you can be on speed one and then and then even like work the variable speed trigger down like below speed one? Well, you're well ahead of me there, mate, because I haven't gotcha. ever bought a Rupes. Gotcha. I haven't actually bought one or a Flex. So I've, I've had the chance to play with a Mark II Bigfoot mm. and I've had a chance to play with Flex VRGs, the 3401 VRG, mm-hmm. and but never actually owned any. Gotcha. And I was I was actually using long throw before Rupes came out with their Bigfoot line. Basically, um, I think it was an American company that uh, had it had it. They bought it out first, I think. Mm. Well, they say one of the few anyway in like 20, 2007 or something like that. And it was a bit primitive. You really had to use the right machine, which I had to find after a worldwide search with like 150 power tool companies and find something that had the torque, the power and the, the gearbox and everything to handle it and the speed range to handle it so I think I could get maximum, I could get maximum performance out of it. But Rupe has really refined it and evolved it in the right direction. Um, mm. But variable speed triggers is definitely where every machine should be. 100%. I mean, they should all have that or they should have what my fine rotary does, which is touch pads. Where you just want to go up and down, you just go dit, 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 dit. There's no trigger at all, but you know, mm. um, that, I like that. Some people may not, but interesting. Variable speed trigger is awesome. That's definitely something that you know is a great, great thing to have because you can just you know sit there and tweak it, whatever mm. you want to do. Yep, yep. And then Lake Country kind of was it sometime last year kind of lets the cat mm-hmm. out of the bag. I'm gonna say a little bit too early. Yep. I wish they would have had a a. Uh, a nice working model uh first yeah. <laughs> so i think they i think uh anyway i'll save my judgments about that for some other time i think it's but the well, machine itself i think is amazing and i think they just wanted to be first to like launch it you know and so yeah and then kind of work I'm, backwards I'm very, I'm very proud of them actually for doing that because that's pretty that's not easy to do and i for since i had my since I've had my Metabo SXE450, which is dual orbit, mm. so you just push a button, put push a button and turn it, and it clicks, and you go from two and a half mil orbit to six point two five. I was always running it in six point two five. Um, basically, I'm sitting there going, "Well, there's a machine here. It's dual orbit, 
and when's it going to come out? And then just when I think, mm. okay, I'm saying to myself, right, it's going to be dual orbit, random orbitals, and maybe dual, hopefully next will be dual orbit gear driven, so you can have a gear driven and random orbital like a PO6000 mm. C Makita, mm-hmm. and basically go and say, okay, I'll be on gear driven at speed at 5.5 mil orbit, and then I'll click random orbital and be on 12. Mm. How nice would that be? Or 10 or 15 or 18 or 16. Especially you when go, you pair it with a multifunction pad, for lack of a better oh, term, right? Oh, yeah. Hello. It, it, and, then a, Hello. and then a multifunction polish, right? It's like, talk about extreme yep. efficiencies, right? Absolutely. It's insane. We've got to get some of those variables cut out of this DM industry. We've got to get some of these polishing variables removed. Yep. yep. Um, but look, I love what they've done. But unfortunately, they. They sort of made me look a little, not a little silly, but certainly go, well, my plan of what I thought was going to happen, which is dual <laughs> orbit, then variable orbit, went right. straight out the window. They just skipped a generation and went straight to variable. Yep. And I went, ah, oh, damn it. Oh, but that's all good. I mean, it's a great thing to see, and I figured that you'd have to do what they did to make it work. And it's if it's if hopefully it's as good as I hope it is. And if it is, it'll be a serious game changer. And... We'll wait and see what the competitors do yeah, next. I'm sure they're. And, I'm sure they're scrambling to. And I don't think Lake Country has even like got to the place where they're uh, releasing them for sale. But it, I, I think it will be very interesting to see kind of when it comes out, how it's adapted by the market, how well it is, and then, like you said, you know, really uh, see the competitors, quote unquote competitors, I guess, or other tool manufacturers, what they do in response, right? And one thing that made me really excited is the past few years at SEMA, I've been incredibly disappointed with the lack of innovation. So especially especially from like a big company like Rupes, I like them, it's all great, but they came on the scene really hot, you know, and then like the past few years, they've kind of just remained the same, right? And it's kind of been... yeah, I, all, but well, I'm talking in extreme, uh, uh, extreme, uh, uh, whatever. So, yeah, whatever. I mean, I'm probably going the defense for for them um, a bit because yes, I don't own one um, yet, but I mean, we have to give them credit for the fact that they went and said, "Oh, let's look at this industry and let's see what we can do for it," because the amount. Of goddamn 100%. companies that I, I, I mean, I did testing, product testing and feedback for Festool. Mm. La, uh, a few weeks ago, I actually sent Makita and they accepted my email with the specs I did. All the specifications, machine speed settings, you know, eight speed dial, what the orbit is, orbits can be, uh, and all this other stuff, like, and sent it to Makita and said, This is what I think you need to do with the PO6000C to make a new version mm-hmm. because it's a little bit too long. It doesn't seem to want to work like I'm used to, used to my Makita BO6050 uh, machine, which is a gear-driven right. It's a it, it spins to the right. Right. Their 6000 C spins to the left. Right. And I went, don't like that. Yeah. And, it, and it wants, and no matter, I I got them to, I bought one machine mm-hmm. of a 6000 C. I had them give me another one to test, and mm. both of them. I had the pad flat, I tried microfiber, I tried all sorts of different pad combinations. Mm-hmm. The thing wanted to go left and right when I was going up and down and yep. up and down when I was going left and right, and it was all over the place. I heard it's very awkward and, to polish with. I mean, my friend Mario from Eurogloss Prestige has mastered it. Good on him. It's a killer machine. It kicks mm. ass, but it just isn't for me. But the amount of times I told Festival, look, you've got... You know, the RO90 DX, a mini force rotation machine with random orbital and the triangular sanding mode. Why can't you just change the machine shape a little bit and make the throw 5 mil or 6 mil or 8 mil or whatever it is? No, nah, they just won't listen. And other companies won't listen. They look at they look at our industry and then talk to me and go, oh, you're a detailing guy. Here, here's a buff. Here's a rotary. Hmm. It's like, dude, there's a massive market here. Mm-hmm. Asia, America, Europe, why don't you do something? Rupes comes along and they go, let's, we may not have invented long throw. Um, Dynabrate, I think, did, or well, someone else, if not them. Certainly, I had my hands on it before the Bigfoot came out, but boy, did they evolve that big time. So I give them credit for that. And, you know, the melee and 
all that stuff that's gone into it and the pad technology, those yellow wools, are, melee wools are phenomenal. I love those things. Mm. No, so, and, you and, know, give them credit. Oh, for hundred, and they, look, they completely changed the whole machine game, right? So, yeah, yeah. definitely, and, and I, I love those guys. They're awesome. I think the company is great. And I appreciate what they've done, right? And then in the it, how they've done the advancements for our industry, I think it's amazing. I just mm, like uh, even, you I want think, more, <laughs> and and I want more. I want to see like cool, like it, you know. And maybe it's my own fault or my own issue, right? Of like, cool, you did that yesterday. What are you going to do for me today, right? So it it could be me, yep. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it's like you go to a show like SEMA, right? Because you want to see someone come out with something like Late Country did. Right. Interesting yeah, that they exactly. released it at Mobile Tech, but that's kind of the expectation. Right. And so and I'm just kind of picking not up that over. easy. It, it's not that easy. Right. At all. Not. And that's or else everyone else would be doing it. And that to your point, that's what made Rupes come on the scene so strong and so fast because they revolutionized something. Right. And that's what kind of yeah. thrust them to the top. Right, so um, I would probably call it massively evolved it, not revolutionized it so much. They might not agree with true, me on that. But true, no, you're right. I was using long. I was using 19 mil orbit throw and 14 before, well before they came out with theirs. And I, however, yes, and I have heard that argument. Better. Yes, I have heard that that not that argument that viewpoint of that they actually didn't invent it. They just brought it into really the detailing space, you know. But yep. whatever that whatever right so um but, but you know what but we do we, we're hungry for innovation i mean yeah. I, I just hate the status quo i want all sorts of things to come out but it costs money it does i mean one of the reasons i haven't bought a root bears is simply i'm just i respect their their opinions on random orbital and it can do a lot of things but it just unless you are extremely good it just I'm like, I could be wrong, and maybe in the future I will be wrong, and that's fine. I've been wrong before. But it just doesn't finish like a rotary. It doesn't correct quite like a rotary. Maybe it can with the kamikaze backing plates and all this other stuff, but I just don't like the fact that sometimes the damn thing won't spin. You know, other people's random orbitals won't spin. I'm a gear-driven rot- gear driven force rotation rotary guy. I've, u- I've been in this industry for 26 years. Um I like my rotary. The other day, I did the roof on my car because it got all these water spots on it after the Bathurst motor motoring event I went to. Mm. Left it for too long and got water spots stitched into it. Two stage rotary, Rupes yellow melee wool, mind you, on a rotary at six hundred RPM, mm. dueling polish, um, basically like the old, the finest finishing polish you can buy. That's pure water based, and then a Flexi, Flexi Pads Viper Black Ultra Fine European Foam. 600 RPM, perfect. And you hit mm. it with a random orbital of any size throw, and the and the color goes down a bit. It just loses mm. that rich color. It just drops it down a little. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm not a random orbital guy. Gotcha, gotcha. But you got to have the skills with the rotary. That's the problem. I mean, it's not it's not hard to use. It's just hard. Sometimes it's a little hard to master, and sometimes it just doesn't want to do it for you. You just right. can't get it. So. Right. Um, so I think we should mention a few other things. Yeah, let's hear it. Away from us. Nope, perfect. So basically, some of the other things I would like to see is a mini force rotation and random orbital polisher with two different orbits. If that can be done, it might not be easy. We industry needs a proprietary two to four inch gear driven polisher with a random orbital mode, so everything can be done with a large one and a mini one. Mm. Because I don't like the idea of say I'm going to use my 6050 Makita, which is a good machine, not for heavy cutting, but certainly for anything else, or a 6000 C or a Flex XCE with a new one, and then go, oh, I'll do the small areas with a three inch force rotation, and you get that same finish. You know, you get you mm-hmm. put a 15 or a you know 15 millimeter three inch on there. What is, it's going to give it a different finish. I mean, unless I'm I mean, I'm not as good as some people. I'm not in the, you know, up the top of the top of the charts when it comes to polishing. Mm. I don't think there's always people that are better than me. But I've always seen that if you change the machine, you get different finishing results. You know, you, the five sure. and a half mil force rotation will give you a real nice finish, maybe really, really good like Rennie can. But you hit it then with 15 mil random, and you go, is either better or it's not, or it just looks different. I don't want it to look different. I want it to be the same. So we need that. Um, I do want to see 
if Lake Country, my manufacturer in France or other companies will do ultra fine grade wool pads, I know some growers in Tasmania. If you're interested, message me. Um, because, I mean, I love wool. I prefer it over microfiber, even though microfiber can correct more. The heat, the fact that it's a petroleum, synthetic petroleum based material. I don't like, I don't like petroleum based materials on myself, but they do work and do a great job. And for me, microfiber pads are a one step thing and that's the end of it. Mm. Bye. Anything else is wool foam. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, I would love to see a revolutionary, a truly revolutionary polishing, uh, polish and formulation. Well, yes, my, my mentor did help create the first ever single polish system, but we're talking about something that is a compound and a polish that is far wetter than all the ones out there even now. And it's spray on and it films perfectly and it stays wet, basically like thick, like runny thickened cream or even milk. One of the ones that I use is basically was the first ever spray on. You just, I've never actually measured, worked out the best sort of spray atomizer to actually use it, but it's literally like you put it on the panel and just runs down the panel on the ground. It's that runny. But, you, you know, I like – we need to have a polished formulation or a compound formulation or both that it stays wetter so that your wool pads and your fiber-based pads can work better. I don't like these dry, slimy-feeling compounds that dry too fast, mm. dust – you know, that clog your wool fibres up. Wool needs to stay moist. You know, sometimes I'll use a little fraction of paraffin oil that I buy from the company and just go, dip, and it just keeps it moist, a bit of water, a bit of, you know, pad lube or whatever, and just keeps it wet, and it just works so nice. One day, you guys should try a finishing polish or an intermediate, maybe a fin mainly, mainly a finishing polish with a wool pad and see how nice and plush and soft mm. it keeps compared to a compound. Mm -hmm. You might not, you won't get the correction as much, but if you're sitting on your own car and you don't care if you spend three times as long, look at the finish you get and look at how nice the wool pad works. It doesn't clog up. It doesn't, mm. you know, cause the issues. Wool's biggest problem initially was all these barbs on it, which would cause the marring and the hologramming. You know, you steam them, but like we've got steamed pads now. It doesn't do that as much. you got the wool, the foamed wools and the hybrid wools and all this other stuff. They finish beautifully, and you just go one pass with the next pad, gone. Hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. we need a revolutionary polish that is, or compound and polish, and then if maybe a finishing one as well. Maybe no more than two. That's it. And you basically can work it longer, better. It's runnier, but it's not just runny. It stays moist on the panel. I tested some recently, and literally compared to mine that I use. I've used since 09 and no one else has ever come close to it. And you literally put it on the panel, wipe it on, leave it. Five minutes later, it's all dry and gritty and pasty feeling. Mine's still wet. Hmm. Right? There's just as runny as mine, but it's not as doesn't stay wet. It's all gritty and pasty and dry. Interesting. Clag. So we need that because I mean I'm I'm not Kevin Brown, but I really believe that fiber based pads, you must keep them moist. If you've got a nice, runny, wet you know, not stupidly wet, so it's like spitting, you know, residue everywhere, but mm -hmm. just enough that it's nice and wet and everything else. They'll work so much nicer. They'll stay better. They stay plus. They don't go all you know, rough and dry feeling, right. and you'll get a far better result. Hmm. So that's have, what I like to see. Get have, rid of all these slimy, dry, and greasy in the bottle polishes. It's either too dry or it's greasy. True, greasy. That's a good point. Yeah, because I was going to say, I, I mean, you know, to to look at the the Meguiar's M110 and to look at who knows if it's new technology or or reformulated old technology right but it is no, I don't think so. it is significantly more runny you know it yeah. it, it does it's have great. the consistency consistency of like a 205 more than like a 100 or 101 or 105 that those real like yeah. old school gritty ones so i definitely think yeah. you're you're spot on with with uh, not only you know, where the technology is going, but where it needs to be, you know? Yeah. Cause, exactly. cause you're right. Now, I have, mm -hmm. I have, I have looked at the MSDS sheet of the 110 and the 210. Mm -hmm. There are a few things in there I don't like, mm. but I mean, I'm not, my mentor was a chemist and taught me a lot of things that detailers don't know, but it doesn't mean I'm, I'm a chemist by any means. And maybe they needed these things for the formulation, but sure. a lot of things that the 
ones that I really hate in a formula mm. is Stoddard solvent, naphtha, de-aromatized kerosene or just straight kerosene, mm -hmm. white, white spirits, which some people use. Mm. Um, there's one that's basically the shortened version is cyclohexasiloxane or pentasiloxane. Mm -hmm. That is potentially, I believe, I've done some research on it, but still no you know, true answer that it's possibly a carcinogenic mm. product and it's a solvent from the skincare industry. Um, which they use in shampoos and things, and I don't like that either. Right. Um, and glycerin, I prefer just, you know, water, paraffin oil, and whatever else in there that works. No castor oil, you know, no triethanol or mines, and, you know, that's a, you need, maybe you need that, maybe you need glycerin for your formula, I don't know, but hmm. my guy doesn't don't use that when he makes his, you know, it's literally hmm. all you see on the MSDS sheet is water, paraffin oil, and basically aluminium oxide of their own design. That's mm -hmm. basically it. It's um, I don't want to get into telling what theirs <laughs> is. I don't even know. But but yeah, I don't like Stoddard solvent. Don't like naphtha. I used to use one well-known brand, and I swear the old stuff from 2002 to 2009 mm -hmm. was better than one of their compounds is now. It's like grease in a bottle. There's no watery lubrication. Interesting. You know, you use it with a you use it with a Rupes blue pad, and you got like balls of dust everywhere not that it's the fault of the blue pad it's the damn product right it's just either they're all either too dry or they're too greasy or they're hard to wipe off and they're slimy you put them in your fingers and you go it starts wet and it just goes to slime mm -hmm. and one of the manufacturers that's quite like big in this country with body shops their latest one my mentor actually told me this and it's I, I take whatever he says as gospel because this man's had 45 years experience in this industry mm. and he's a chemist and he knows a lot of shit about paint. And he said, I watched this guy use it and it turned to cement on the panel. Oh, jeez. <laughs> jeez. Um, <laughs> so, not wow. a good formulation, I'm sorry. Right, but right. anyway, moving on. <laughs> um so, yeah, we need revolutionary. At some point, I would like us to get away from aluminium oxide. I don't know if it's doable. I don't know if it's affordable. What can be done? But even if we can't, let's at least keep moving with the technology, see what we can do with it. Um, because, I mean, you imagine if you had an abrasive that was corrected a little bit faster than aluminium oxide, but it wasn't crystalline silica because there's a lot of issues with that. Right, but it finished a little bit better, and you could do almost any car at speed one with any machine. I mean, yeah, it makes it idiot proof and takes maybe some of the mastery out of it and whatever else. But I mean, everyone seems to always want more faster cut, faster cut. I'm all about the finish. I don't care if I take three times as two times as long as somebody else to do the correction. I'm about how much gloss can mm -hmm. I give this customer for the price mm -hmm. and for each price bracket. That's what I used to be anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was expensive. I wasn't a cheap guy. My one steps were 700 bucks, but it was like 95% correction with one pad. Mm. You know, so on almost every car. And, a, and I didn't do any DA haze ever mm. with a microfiber on any car. Um, wow. That's mainly due to the polish, not me. Right. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, it would be nice if we could just – because, I mean, I've, I've – you know, Ivan LaCroix has talked about low speed and he's absolutely spot on. Mm -hmm. And I started playing with that back in probably 07 or 08 going, what if I do this? What if I just sit on speed one on a DA, you know, right. a little short throw? Yeah, what if, what if I go on one, two, and that's it? And mm -hmm. I got awesome finishing quality. It took longer to correct, of course. But sure. now it's just like you're saying, you know, speed one rotary. I'm sitting here right. the other day fixing a naked panel on an Alfa Romeo, like some 80s Alfa Romeo, single stage paint, and a speed one, and it was just come up like a piece of glass. Mm. And I just went, mm, nice, no wool marks, nothing, with a 3D wool pad, and then I went, black foam, perfect, no holograms, nothing. Wow. You know, speed one, the whole car, and it was knackered. Wow. And it wasn't soft paint either. Right. So, Interesting. Um, okay, so, moving along real quick. What else we got here? Um... Look, I know about – look, I'm not sure what the OEM manufacturers are going to do with their paints. They may change, but if they're going to go thinner, one thing that I wasn't actually the person that came up with this idea it was my friend Chris. He said, what if we had one day – like you just go, you can't polish these cars, these certain cars. They're just too darn thin. What if we had some kind of long-term filler-based coating that you could put it on the car – and it lasts for six months, 12 months, and the customer just comes back 
every three months or however you want to design it so that everything comes out except for the deep scratches. You just fill the whole lot and basically it's a coating so it protects, but it fills in all those swells and those all that wash marring and all that for either as long as you want it to be so that you, customers still come back, they pay a certain fee and it's just put it on, done. I think That's that would it. be no I think problem. that would be awesome. I think we again it's funny to see to like hear this stuff and then see kind of like glimpses of it kind of come out, right? So like look yep. at what Optimum, Optimum Yep, Optimum came out with that yep. clear coat restorer. Clear coat store. Yep, which there there's good stuff. There's also another company in Canada that does a uh surprisingly similar product that I forget yes, I know the, of them. Yes. You know, and so I forgot it's, what the brand name is, though. I, I forgot too, but it's, hmm, I don't know. Interesting. Very interesting how yeah. similar they are. Anyway, uh, irrelevant. Yeah. So, I, but yeah. I, but I think it plays to exactly what you're talking about. Is like, you well, know, I'll, yeah. Which I thought, you know, Optimum's Clear Coat Restore. I don't know enough about it to really speak on it for cars that aren't neglected to the point that they're currently recommending it. But I was thinking, what would happen with that product if you put it on as mm. a coating instead of a traditional like ceramic coating like would it be better yeah you know yeah exactly um that's right i mean it doesn't obviously cover ivan's already shown in the video that you know it covers road rash and things like that but it won't fix you know failed clear coat like a wipe on a true wipe on clear coat right right but it's a damn good product for something like my car yeah i mean my hilux i mean it's got repainted but there's a bit of road rash on the right on the front bumper on the side and yep. this and that and what dents all over it you know things like that my Ford's a lot nicer thankfully but um it's ideal for something like that but you know why not um the other thing too which i don't know if it's ever going to be doable because you have to have con- you have to have contact with you know the metal piece on the bottom of a paint thickness gauge to actually measure the paint, but wouldn't it be awesome if somehow one day we could actually measure the paint as we're doing it, right? And literally, it's off to the side of where the pad is, and you're just going along. And as you're going along, you can read it on the machine going, oh, 102, 101 microns, 99, okay, 96, I better stop right there. And it's exactly mm. like you can tell. If you say, okay, she's got 152 microns, should be fine, you know, and you go down to 148 with a wool pad, you know, 3.784 microns or 5 microns with a microfiber or something. But you can know what's there as you're going. I mean, it's probably not going to be even doable. I don't know if it's even doable. But my God, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, that'd be and really And the cool. other thing too, to really make this industry take some, take some of the guesswork out of, you know, removing scratches, scratch gauges do exist. Apparently, they are quite expensive, really expensive. But I'm hoping that someday they become cheap enough, affordable enough for the top guys and even some other lower end guys that they can literally go, oh, you've got a scratch on your car. Let me have a look. You measure it and you go, okay, it's like 6.8 microns thick or 10 or something like that. And you go, well, there's enough. Well, there is enough space. And then you can have a system. You can work out what pads, uh, what what to sand it with that will remove most of that and then polish it and remove the last of it. And you've only removed exactly the thickness that, that that damaged layer of paint none of the good stuff interesting and it could be that exact because wow. one thing one thing Rennie taught, told me once was that you know like don't I think he said something like don't you know don't you know go through the, the good paint only you know treat the, the damaged paint if you've got scratch that's four or five microns don't take seven or eight you right. know, you, you, you're removing good clear coat and that really hit my stuck in my head and I thought you know, I wish we could be that exact mm. and know. Wouldn't that be cool? And yeah, I reckon it might fun. happen one day. I mean, if we went from having nobody had a thickness gauge and it was just blind buffing, mm-hmm. and these days I wouldn't touch anything without one. Mm. And I'm always measuring. Um, and, you know, that would be nice. And the other reason why I mentioned long-term fillers, a coating, long-term filler coating or something like a gel or something that dries and it just covers everything, is I measured a Hyundai Santa Fe early last year. It had 78 microns on there. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those $4,000 ones that can measure three layers. And so I did a test, polished it, and I went, hmm, it's clear coated. How much of that is the clear coat? 10, 20 microns or 50 Mm. or what? I don't know. So I said, I ain't polishing this car. Maybe it had piles, maybe it didn't. 
Oh, I'm not touching it. So if they're coming, and that was a near new car, right? And then I measure a car the other day, which is like a near new Ford Focus, and it's 152, 158. And you go, oh, the Europeans painted it. This one did, did it well. You know, some of these Asian cars, man, there's like a lick of paint on. <laughs> right, right. And usually no uh, interior carpets, which is crazy. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother subject. Uh, so, yeah, there we go, mate. That's pretty much most of it. That's uh, amazing. That's, yeah. That's amazing. To extract it would be nice too, but that's going to be damn hard to invent that one. Yep. You know? Yep. And it's I prefer Steam too. If it, did, if it does, I can tell you what, it'll revolutionize the game. I want it, but how the hell it's going to be invented, <laughs> I ain't smart enough. That's amazing. That's amazing. Matt, you've put on a clinic for the past almost hour, and it's been yep. super awesome to, to have you back. I'm super glad we did this again. If people uh, are in the southern part of Australia, in Australia, or wherever they are in the world, how can they get a hold of you to kind of pick your brain, ask you questions, maybe connect yep. with you to make some of these things come to life? How can they do that? Yeah, well, basically, you can uh, email me using my old, old – uh, business email address, um, which is detailx.sa. Say it again. Your fo- the phone cut out. Say it again. Okay. Detailx.sa.sa at gmail.com. Perfect. Or go on Facebook, look up Matthew Gibbs, send me a message. And all you guys in this industry, listen to this. I'm here for you. If you need help with anything that I can help you with, especially with technical stuff with polishing, um, I'm here for you because you know what? I love this industry and I want to see it thrive and really go way ahead of where it is now. Awesome, man. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, mate. It's been awesome. Really appreciate it. And maybe we can do another one in maybe two or three, four months' time. What do you reckon?